All right, that's the cue. So welcome everybody. This is uh, your uh, special guest office hours for spring 2020. With us is uh, Professor Michael Lehman. Uh, he is not not only professor for our course, but also, well, uh, I guess you're not technically a Georgia Tech professor anymore, even though you were the first semester, is that correct? No, I'm an adjunct professor still. I was then and I am now, but huh. I'm not a but I'm I, but I'm not an instructor for the courses. I'm just kind of, I don't know, meat on the courses. Right, instructor of record or something like that. Yeah, I was lucky enough to actually take the course fall 2015 and you were actually in Piazza answering student questions and so on. So that was that was Yes, very they, that is true. They have thing. removed my Piazza rights. I no longer have the ability to do that. <laughs> and I don't think you want them. <laughs> Uh, so, well, what, so you're a full-time basic professor uh, of computer science at Brown University, uh, and I think you have a couple of fellow names, and I think, you know, ACM is a big one, ACM fellow. Uh, more recently, you tweeted about uh, AAAS Leshner fellow, uh, and, you know, even though I personally do not know what those things mean, I know that whenever I see fellow, you pay respect and listen, right? <laughs> Yeah, so so the um, the the two like real fellow things that I have are AAAI fellow and ACM fellow. And the ACM fellow, I think people in the class might appreciate because uh, Charles Isbell and I uh, basically got each other nominated. We acted acted as each other's nominators, and so um, we kind of went through the process. We both both got tapped. We went to the um, the induction ceremony together in San Francisco. It happened to be the year that the deep learning guys won the Turing Award. It was it was really surprisingly moving. It was a great time. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know, for those who want, uh, you can go to Twitter and you actually tweeted a couple of pictures, uh, having fun yeah. with uh, Jan Lacoon as well, and and you know, receiving the really nice, nicely dressed. Uh, yeah, we, and, we wore you know, tuxedos. It was very cool. I mean, Charles, as yeah. you know, like, you know, he cleans up nice. So, uh, so we, we both got to be in our, you know, spy. Good, good. So I, I think one of the main things that I've, you know, um, one of the main things that I admire of, of you, would, you know, in a, in a humble sense, but I don't, I don't want to, you know, put you in the spotlight or too much, but it's like, you actually been working uh, on reinforcement learning since like the 1990s, basically. I would say the 1980s. Yeah. 80s. Look at that. Yeah. And you know, my I first saw my first whenever... papers. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just my my very first published paper was in 1989, and it was a reinforcement learning paper. But I got I got interested in in it um, in college, and I was thinking about it it, it back like 1985. But there wasn't a lot going on. Like I kind of posed it as a problem because it seemed like the right problem to think about. But it wasn't until after I graduated that I learned. Oh wait, this is there's actual people who study this. And one of the really interesting things that happened to me uh, at the time, I was working with with Dave Ackley, who had done some reinforcement learning for his dissertation work. He's one of the co-authors of the Boltzmann machine paper. So he, he kind of helped make neural nets a thing again. And uh, we were working on reinforcement learning stuff. And I was like, well, okay, I get this and I get this, but I don't like it's like how would you think about this? How would you like integrate this with neural networks? He's like, oh, you should read Rich Sutton's papers. Rich Sutton's paper, and I'm like, I don't get it. And he's like, oh, well, let's have him explain it to us. And so we'll have we'll invite him to give a talk. I'm like, wait a second, you can do that? Like these are actual human beings that you can like make materialize and make presentations. So Rich came came down and and gave us a talk in uh, this is probably 1988. Uh, uh, he was just starting to talk about Q learning because he had just met with Watkins and, and kind of worked that out. And it was like front row seat. It was amazing. So yeah, I've been doing this not since the beginning, but since near the beginning. Yeah, and the paper that you're talking about is actually the 1988 learning to predict by methods of uh, temporal difference. Is that correct? Very good. Yeah, so, and you probably know that um, our first project actually requires students to replicate the results. You probably know because you basically, you know, asked our course to put that, you know, as the project uh, back in the day. And we still have it as our project, but it's actually our first project. So can you give us a little bit of insight as to why this, um, you know, timeless paper, because it is timeless, uh, is, is a good way for introducing reinforcement learning to our students? 
or any sure, sort sure, of right. So, I mean, from a theoretical perspective, it, it's it's absolutely central. I mean, from a historical perspective, it's absolutely central. It really kind of got people thinking about things uh, from a perspective that makes sense from a reinforcement learning standpoint. It's not it's not just supervised learning. It's a different thing, and the temporal aspect is really important. I just today actually wrote a recommendation letter for Rich Sutton, and so I wrote a paragraph or two about why I think the his 1988 paper was so so essential, so so important in in the field. And if if you look at all the different ways that we solve reinforcement learning problems now, they're not all TD Lambda, but in fact, if you look closely enough, they actually are. They're not the Lambda is gone, but at least t variations of TD zero are infused into policy search algorithms, which are kind of the best way of approaching things now from a deep learning perspective. Hopefully that won't be permanent, but at the moment that is the way that the, the, the people approach these things. TD is hiding in there in, in the way that the estimate actually gets computed. And in model-based approaches, uh, model-based reinforcement learning, where you mainly, what you're learning is, is to predict transitions. Okay, well once you can predict transitions, how do you decide what to do? It becomes TD again. It's just TD in your head as opposed to TD in the world. Right, right. Even even perhaps uh, actor critic methods that the critic the critic is is commonly use uh, trained uh, using bootstrapping, right? So, or actually not just bootstrapping, but TD zero, right? So, the entire. Yeah. So, as a follow up, uh, uh, you you mentioned that, um, you hope that policy search or deep learning with policy policy search met methods, which are currently the best. Um, you hope that will no longer be the case. Why is that? Yeah. Okay. So that's. Um, I mean, that's a that's a that's a personal statement. That's not necessarily a professional statement. <laughs> okay. But I, I think because because for me the, the you know the, the the my interest in reinforcement learning is very grounded in artificial intelligence. Like we want to make things that are kind of smart and get along in the world. And I think that what policy search methods or actor critic methods are actually learning is a policy and policies are kind of brittle they're just a way of behaving they're not a way of kind of engaging with the world it's just like I'm gonna follow my script I'm gonna follow this program if you can find me a good program that gets me high reward that's great but you don't have to really understand the world to follow a good program so like the the right hand rule for getting out of a maze is really effective but it's not really understanding the maze right so um, to me model based methods are what I hope the future will be, uh, methods that actually learn how does the world work, what's going to happen in the future, of these possible futures, which do I think is, is more in line with what I want to have happen, all right, I'm going to take my actions to try to bring that about. Um, that I think is where we have to go, but at the moment in the kind of deep learning world, uh, that's been the least successful of the three branches of RL algorithms. So. Um... And, and you know, unfortunately, I'm already breaking the script, but I'm going to ask a question here because uh, I know that you've been uh, recently working on causal uh, inference or causal learning. So how do you relate causal learning to, because it seems to me that it's related to model-based RL, but I haven't seen it, you know, uh, in an intuitive sense at least. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, the intuitive sense is mainly where we are at this point. Um, but the, the the notion is that you know an agent that's interacting with an environment should try to understand the causal affordances of that environment, right? What is the environment actually doing? How is it going to respond to me, and why? And uh, if you don't have a, a kind of a causal description of that, if you have something I don't know else uh, that that has various kinds of uh, possibly biases baked in. Uh, you can predict, okay, okay, so one thing at a time. So so what I'm trying to say is that, in general, a transition model is a causal model, right? It's a thing that says, what will happen if I were to do this? If I were to intervene in the world and take this action, what will happen next? So I think just right out of the box, we're talking causal. If you, okay. at the moment, the, w the main way that we understand and we learn these models is using just normal learning technology, which isn't particularly causal, and the result of that is that you can actually get really weird behavior. You can get a, a transition predictor that's extremely accurate on the data that you've collected, but then when you actually start to use that to change how you're behaving in the world, you're gathering data according to a different distribution, your, your predictions start to fail. And so it's only when we have a, an actual causal model, one that's distribution independent, 
right? That we're going to be able to really be able to make decisions and know what effect they're going to have on the world. So is it safe to say that uh, causal uh, learning uh, for model-based RL will be more using a, uh, an architecture such as a NATO encoder or some kind of compress, uh, some kind of architecture that compresses information into a smaller set of variables, kind of inner variables, uh, latent variables, what it's called, right? Uh, and then uh, would that be a little safer to say, or what are your thoughts about that? I think this is completely up in the air still. I, I think that if you look at the there. causal learning community, they assume that the, they assume two things and they unassume one thing. So the two things they assume are one is that the the perception of the environment is in terms of high level abstract concepts. There's basically variables that say things like, is this true or false about the world? How we get that from perception, that's not their problem, but it's kind of our problem. So it's kind of a bummer that they <laughs> have assumed it away. But they, they assume that they have this kind of high order, kind of database style uh, description of the environment. So that's one thing they assume. The other is that they assume that they have information that says how those variables interact with each other. What is the causal influence of one variable on another variable? What they get for that, for making those two assumptions, what they get for that is they don't have to assume that the data was uh, was gathered according to um, they can handle what's what's called observational data, right? So that's data that's collected according to some distribution that may not be the distribution that we want to do our prediction in. They can then split those two things from each other and say, if I uh, gather the data in this environment where the where the statistical relationships between the variables are like this, but now later we want to intervene, we want to take actions in the environment, we can still make accurate predictions uh, using the kinds of tools of the causal community. So that's awesome. But I think it's kind of reversed from what we care about in reinforcement learning. So this is what my students and I are try trying to think about lately, is we don't have the causal model. We don't know how the variables influence the other variables and we don't get perception for free. But we, do, we don't have to just live with observational data. We can actually intervene on the environment and see what happens. We can try things, right? An agent in a reinforcement learning right. algorithm uh, environment can say, hey, what would happen if I was over there and did this thing? I don't know. Let me right. do you it. You can set experiments and then, yeah. You can set your exactly. experiments and then learn from those. That's interesting. So, so, so they don't have much, the causal community doesn't have much to say about that case because they've been mostly concerned with the case of observational data. And they don't have as much to say about learning the causal structure as we might want them to. So I think, I think they're, I think what they did is really important. But I think we have a lot more work to do before we can actually use it in an RL setting. Yeah, that's great. I actually also saw recently a framework by, um, um, uh, I think I'm gonna say Google probably Google AI or something. I really don't know who who released this framework, but it's actually to do causal. Uh, inference or cost of learning with uh, reinforcement learning just recently actually a couple of, a couple mm. of weeks ago yeah very interesting so i think a, a lot of people are actually starting to look into that uh you know issue good Baruch, did yeah, you have a follow-up yeah I, I, have a, I have a follow-up i guess while we're on the topic uh i was i mean as a more abstract i was recently reading the book of why by pearl Me too. Uh, i don't know if I you're read that too yeah okay and i just wanted to you know um you know, I mean, his work, his recent work is a lot, you know, uh, more in causal, um, in the causal community. And I was wanted to just get your thoughts on, you know, some of his work and um, uh, that book in particular, if you've read it. Yeah, I mean, that's specifically where I'm coming from with the description that I just gave before, that um, that Pearl's Do Calculus gives this beautiful account of how you can reason about the relationships between variables uh, in the in the face of interventions, in the face of actually changing the way that the distribution of data is is being created, so I think that's super cool and it's and it's really neat. The book itself is, you know, it has issues. Like he, um, I've I've talked to people in other fields. So he he in the book for people who haven't read the book. So it's called the Book of Why. He had an earlier book on causality uh, that was a bit more technical. This was intended to be kind of broad audience, what they call a trade book. And um, he he spends a good chunk of the book being very mad at statisticians that statisticians have let us down and actually not only let us let us down but held us down 
right? That they, they the, the way that they decided to, to reinforce this idea of um, correlation does not equal causation is opp oppressive, and it doesn't let us think about some really important problems. And so, you know, Pearl is here to set us free, get us, get us, uh, you know, able to think about these problems again. And 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 he's doing that, and that's great. But what he doesn't do quite well enough, I think, is notice that people in biostatistics have been doing this. People in econometrics have been doing this. They have a. They're not shocked by the things he's saying because they are exactly the same problems that they've been grappling with over the past couple decades. So I think that he, I think he likes to paint himself as, uh, you know, the tilter at windmills, right? They're the, the lone soldier out there kind of fighting the battle on all our behalf. But in fact, he's part of this extremely big community of people who are actually using these ideas to solve hard problems, uh, you know, in, in other fields as well. But for me, it was great because he, he's a computer scientist and he talks like a computer scientist. And so like now all this stuff makes sense to me, but I, I don't want people to, to leave that book with the impression that nobody had this worked out before. Um, what I think Pearl has done remarkably well is provided a very computer science-y map for how to do these kinds of computations. But in one-off cases, in specific cases, um, the, the biostatisticians and econometricians they know how to do it in special cases that actually come up all the time. And so they're, they haven't learned as much from this as you might think listening to Pearl. Oh, yeah. It's it's like that term in biology, convergent evolution, where you have, like, different animals evolving, evolving to, like, the same features, but they came from uh, different origins, right? So, like, these different fields are looking at these problems um, over time and kind of converging to, the, like, the same, like, you know, the same techniques or the same uh, paradigm. Yeah, which is cool, and that there's a certain rightness about it, right? Like, why are you know ichthyosauruses and dolphins and marlins all having the same shape when they have entirely different histories? It's because they're trying to shoot through the water really fast, and so the fact that that all these different fields are trying to make inferences from data and understand what happens when you intervene, when you actually like do a treatment. Um, yeah, it's great that they all ended up coming up with the same set of ideas. It means that these are actually the right ideas for this problem. Uh, qu a quick follow-up, uh, so we're here. Hi, Professor uh, Lippmann. Um, I just want to ask, um, what, what's your current thought on how you, you talk about how we were trying to, we should, we should try to first learn the causal model, right? What's your current thought on how do, how do we learn the causal model? First of all, what, like how do you model the causality and then how you learn this model? Right. Right. So, right. so great, great question. So it's obviously we have to think about how we're representing the transition function, yes. right? The, we want a function that takes in now and produces what will happen if I were to do X or A because, you know, actions. So um, the form of that can take, could be the form of any function, right? All we need is a function. And the important thing is that the function look at the correct variables, right? And, and use them in the correct way. Yes. So really the issue I think uh, what, com what it comes down to is that when you're collecting data somewhat passively, there are often many different functions that are consistent with the data that you've seen so far. And you don't know which ones are actually, you know, like the rule that says how the environment works. And so at least the, the way that we're looking at it in my group is we'll say, well, we have to learn all of those. We have to learn as many of those functions as we can. And then to disambiguate between those functions, we have to do active experimentation in the environment. We have to say, what's a thing that I could do in the environment where this model makes one prediction and this other model that, that, I've, that I'm considering makes a different prediction? At which point uh, I can, you know, the agent can actually take actions in the world create that data and then distinguish between those two models, hopefully invalidating one and supporting the other. Right. Um, so you're talking about, but for, for a causal model, right? You have uh, A cause B, you have, the, you, have the, you have the links that you have to learn. And then second, you have the functions that represent the links, right? Like, like the, how does A cause B, right? So, so first of all, how you, you're talking about the links, learning the links, right? Does A cause B, right? Or you're talking about both? The function is everything, right? The function is something that takes in the current state and makes a prediction. And you can't make a prediction oh, unless you have both the links and the whatever sort of numerical quantities the, that, that the model depends on. But you're right. If, when you're organizing your search, 
it can be easier to think about those two problems separately or, or in, in sequence, right? Where first I need to understand, is there any, does this thing have any influence at all? And then later I can fine tune and say, oh, it has influence, how much influence does it have? Or what's the precise details of the influence? But the level I'm talking about it now, it's like, no, 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 we, there's just a set of possible functions that are fully instantiated and we have to distinguish between them. Mm, I see. Cool. All right, so there. So another question, or yeah, so uh, uh, you had a lot of uh, uh, students actually asking a, a similar question that you mentioned in uh, in one of your uh, interviews on a podcast, I guess it was uh, Talk RL. Uh, you mentioned something about the DQM paper. So, you know, the 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 uh, 2015 paper by Vlad Min and all, all the other folks at uh, uh, DeepMind uh, introduced DQM. Now DQN looks like a, you know, I'm trying to make reinforcement learning look like supervised learning as much as I can. I'm gonna make a supervised learning because that's how we know how to, you know, use function approximation and so on. And we're gonna force that problem into a different kind of problem so that we can train a network and solve the problem, right? Uh, but you did mention uh, something uh, related to that and you do have a paper also, uh, uh, on, on this topic, I think Deep Mellow uh, tries to solve some of the some of the issues of uh, DQN. So the questions are: one, can you can you tell us what what do you think are the be the contributions the the best contributions that DQN um, besides you know getting a lot of people excited about uh, deep reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning in general, which is a really good one, right? And, and then important. second, uh, talk talk a little bit about your your contributions with Deep Mellow. Sure, sure. So yeah, so I think that the fact that um, that DQN got so many people excited about the field is itself a tremendous contribution. And the reason that people got excited is because what they did was a, was a remarkable, right? It's a very hard thing that uh, the people have been struggling with in one form or another for a long time. And they, they not only kind of got up to the level where everyone else had tried, but they just leapfrogged way ahead. And they just, they just changed the landscape of what people could consider to be uh, you know, a, a, an exciting result in the field. They just they just blew the doors off of it. I was around in the days of uh, T.D. Gammon, and T.D. Gammon had a similar uh, kind of uh, impression on people. It's like, wait a second, if you can do that, there's all these other things we might be able to do too. Let's try that out. So, um, so I think that was great. Now, from an algorithmic standpoint, there, yeah, they had to do some very specific things to get this to work, right? So they had to be masters of convolutional networks. Um, which at the time very few people were, they had to figure out, okay, well, a standard problem when you try to do function approximation and reinforcement learning is uh, these, these networks can become very unstable. They actually, it's very common to see something uh, where it starts off poor and then after some amount of experience, it gets better and better and better. And then at some point it kind of peaks. And then if you keep training it, it starts to get bad and then really bad and then worse than where you even started. And so that's a, when I've had students implement like backprop and, and TD together, that is like the standard pattern. And in fact, the DQN people also had that pattern. They just were smart enough to stop before the decay happened, right? So it's, it's if you run their algorithm further than what they do in the paper, it does exactly what all the other algorithms do, which is it just completely falls apart until it's actually performing worse than random. But um, but you know they were they were brilliant and, and they were brilliant in a bunch of ways. But they, they were they were somewhat sneaky and and successful by actually figuring out okay well how long is this going to stay viable? Let's cut off the graphs at that point. <laughs> so I wouldn't call that a contribution, but it is it is they had to fight against this issue that um, that function approximation in RL has, and and they did a bunch of things to do that right. They 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 hold on to. Um, to pass values so they're not changing too rapidly. And I think that did stave off the decay uh, long enough that they could catch it at the top of the arc, stop there. And one of the things that Deep Mellow is trying to do specifically is to kind of soften that, that you don't have to depend so cru crucially on freezing, locking down the values for long periods of time so that instabilities don't arise by essentially adding in a little bit of uh, averaging, by smoothing out the maxes uh, that also staves off that de decline, and so we can get some pretty good results from that. I guess I was mute. mute. Okay, so yeah. from the paper, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, from the paper, uh, you you made it seem as if as if uh, true online reinforcement learning is important instead of having this target network and this kind of replay buffer, right? From from you know where they kind of pull the the set the, the experiences. Uh, why is that? And and yeah, can can you tell us why why you feel if that is the case? Why why you feel that way? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I think there's there's a couple of reasons. One is that we would really like these learning algorithms to have as few parameters as possible, right? So to the extent that we have to pick a whole bunch of parameters to get it to work on a problem, if we're honest with ourselves, it's much less like learning that way, right? That we have to already know how this, the, the algorithm is going to solve the problem to set the parameters so it can solve the problem. And so we're kind of cheating, right? The the, the the vision, the reinforcement learning vision is one that says hard problem, you know, algorithm, chunk, do, 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 success. Um, and it's not hard problem, parameterized solution, run, fail, tweak some parameters, run, fail, tweak some parameters, run, fail, tweak some parameters, success, right? Because, uh, like, why didn't we just solve the problem at that point? Uh, so, so from that perspective, um, having to pick a, a, a parameter that says something like freeze your value function for this amount of time. It has to be a parameter because it, uh, if you make it too short, then it's going to be, it's going to lose that stability property that you were hoping for. If you let it, uh, if you freeze it for really long periods of time, then learning becomes extremely slow, right? Because the system is not able to actually make use of what it newly learned. You're basically stopping it from using anything that it learned. Uh, for long periods of time and so you want to set that parameter just so oh man it's just nicer to get rid of it so that's part of it and the other part of it is by getting okay. rid of it you at least have the possibility of learning kind of in real time right like we i think we envision these learning algorithms as ones that they they're acting in the world they discover something and then they make use of that <laughs> like ah, that's that, that's like if a person acted this way, like you teach them for an entire day and then they go to sleep at night and then they use, you know, then they actually incorporate what you know and then the next day they come back smarter. Well, that's good because they came back smarter, but like talking to them that first day is like talking to a wall because they can't apply anything that they've newly been exposed to. That they've been I, learning I online, follow yeah. Follow up. Yeah, yeah so go, that's uh, my argument for learning online. Yeah, go ahead. No, one thing um, on this topic that I've I've noticed personally, but I haven't applied it to large scale problems, is shifting to an on policy approach like Sarsa. You can see a lot more stability. I, I don't see the same type of falling off of a cliff. And I noticed in some of their later papers, they have one um, called asynchronous methods for deep reinforcement learning. They actually do a one step Sarsa, and it does well, but they, it doesn't seem like they really go deeply into that and explain why. I was wondering if if people have actually pursued that approach for harder problems, and if that shows a little, if that's promising from a stability standpoint. Yes, it's definitely the case that folks like Rich Sutton have argued that a lot of the problems that we see are due to the fact that we're not willing to run SARSA-like things. SARSA-like things dodge a lot of these issues. I think it's hard though in the deep reinforcement learning setting because. These methods, first of all, they're extremely expensive to run. And so getting like one piece of new knowledge about the environment, one transition in the game or in the, in the, in the robots world, and then running this machinery, it's just, uh, that's a lot. Uh, second of all, they don't always work as well when you train them one step at a time. They kind of, at least in the, in the, the modern deep learning era, they really benefit from having a batch, right? Having enough data that can actually kind of tell us the direction that we should be moving all of these weights. So it's both efficiency in terms of computation, but also efficiency in terms of data that, that kind of force us to batch things up. So I don't know if we had, yeah, if we had a better way of incorporating that information fast, uh, that would be great, but I, I think it's hard. Do you think something like meta learning, like or meta RL could help in that regard? I love the idea of, of meta learning, especially if if it allows us to get rid of the parameters, right? I think I think there's reason to believe that something like meta learning is absolutely essential because if we don't meta learn, if we if we say, oh, we're just going to do reinforcement learning on one problem at a time, 
then we're, we're going to tweak the parameters. We're going to try to set it up so that it runs better for that one problem. The only way we can force ourselves to be hands off is to, is to adopt a meta learning kind of stance that says, here's a set of problems that your learner has to run on. I'll let you play with them all you want. But finally, you have to deploy something that's going to learn hands off. And so I really love that. Is that a solution? Uh, I mean, you know, arguably it's solving, you know, it's, it's what it's, it's uh, killing an ant with a bazooka sort of thing. Like it, it, <laughs> if, if you're really trying to find a good policy and that's all you care about, meta learning is, is a <laughs> very, very heavyweight way of doing that. It's man, it's so hard. It's so slow. It's so brittle. Um, but like in principle, that is the direction we should be going. I just think at the moment, it's it's not a it's not a piece of machinery that we can just wheel out and you know solve our problems for us. So, quick follow up to your answer to uh, Bahia's question. You mentioned as if uh, the difference between uh, a sort of DQN and more SARSA approach, SARSA like approaches was the batch the batching. So the online versus batching. But, uh, but you know, it, so what about the, the just uh, the on policy versus off policy? And, you know, uh, you know, as a as a follow up to that, can you talk a little bit about the deadly triad and, um, you know, kind of explain it a little bit to our to our students? <laughs> How many headaches you get uh, out of that? <clears throat> All right. So the deadly triad was named by Rich Sutton and it's, it's I think it's function approximation off policy and bootstrapping. and bootstrapping oh come bootstrapping. on you know this do i though do i <laughs> um it's yeah it's not something that i think about all the time it's just it's 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 a very rich way oh, okay. of breaking up the world and i don't spend a lot of my 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 time in that frame uh but i know i have to be oh, able to good. think in that okay. frame because you have to be able to communicate with rich but it is not how i break up the world no not at all Oh, that's good. Um, that's a that's a great take. Okay. Maybe it's a hot. Take. So I guess Maybe my controversial. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my my question would be like, how do you break up the world, like uh, versus person to how rich does? Model free and model based. Let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, model model based and well, so I you know I do model based, <laughs> model free, and policy search, right? That's in the algorithm space. I usually think of things that way. But in the okay. in the model based RL setting, yeah, like do you have like what's bootstrapping? Like what is that? Like it's not even it's not even directly a thing that you have to think about. It's a very TD kind of concept. Uh, ah, function approximation, yeah, a hundred percent. So so one of the so if if I had to make a deadly triad, I don't know if I could come up with three on the fly like <laughs> this, but maybe we can pause the video, give me an hour. You're not locked at three. That. You're not locked at three yet. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, nobody wants to hear me think this through because it's. So <laughs> but, um, but we a, a thing that we have named and and, and talk about a lot is um, yeah. There's a name for it. I'm just, I'm just blanking a little bit. It's it's the idea of making a prediction and and feeding that prediction. So in model based RL, you make a prediction. If there's any error in that prediction and you feed it back to make a prediction for two steps into the environment, these errors tend to get magnified. Residual? And so kind of residual? Residual. Uh, residual? Residual amplification. It's not just that there's a residual. There's always a residual. It's that the residual, whatever the error is, it becomes larger. It gets actually, it explodes. The error explodes. Um, so I have a paper with my current student, Kavosh Asadi, and he... He uses a particular word for it. I'm just blanking on, on on what that word is. But that's one of the that's like we don't know what to do with that. That's that's a killer for us because if you can't if you're doing function approximation and you're doing multi-step prediction, then you get these two things together can blow up on you uh, unless unless we can come up with some way of stopping it. I see. I see. And it's related. It's, like it's very much related. Model, it's like using your model for a rollout of the policy. So you use the same model for, and then feed it back with the, the state, the next state prediction, and then back with the, the action and so on. Is that basically what it is? Yes. Cool. Interesting. Compounding error. That's uh, that's what mm -hmm. we call it. <laughs> we have it kind of reminds me of like control. Compounding error problem. It reminds you of control. Oh, because in control theory, they have compounding error as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because it's what you have if you have multiple steps decisions. 
Yeah. So that will be that will be one. Let's see if I can get ah, to that. Uh, well, <laughs> that with function approximates because we don't really have because function, but it's a different function. We're approximating the model. Um, right. And and because there's error in that model and we're doing a rollout with it, yeah, it gets it gets bad. Um. And I don't know. And then I'm going to say causality, and I'll think about it more later. Because the the idea well, is that you, you gotta, need to you have gotta make it three because you you can you cannot sell it if you don't make it three. It's catchy. It's gotta be catchy. I got three. I got three. Function approximation, okay. multi-step predictions, and causality. Oh, look at that! Like it. Boom. Uh, and the causality thing is, is that you want to make sure you're conditioning <laughs> on the right variables so that you become distribution independent. The funny thing, though, is, of course, you're never going to be distribution independent, right? It's always going to be the case that um, you you can't master the entire huge universe. So you're really you're always stuck mastering some subset of it, and it could be that the thing that you've mastered it on, if you extrapolate even further out, will start to fail. So, like, I know how to throw a grape and catch it in my mouth, but this doesn't work if I'm in zero gravity. I'm just very rarely in zero gravity, and so it's fine. So getting getting a big enough part of the space covered um, is is really all we can hope for. It's just at the moment, at least in the the RL algorithms that I've been running on these video games, um, they learn the narrowest little tightrope of the states that they tend to see an awful lot during training, and they're very good in those states. But if you push them off even a little bit, they just they just fall into the you know the the waterfall. Right, right. And it's actually a really good follow up. Uh, this next question here, uh, this is a student question, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to read it. So most of most of the research in RL is only applicable to artificial domains like computer games. There has been attempts with RL on real world business requests, like rec like to recommend their systems or chatbots, uh, but they can hardly outperform supervised learning or rule-based approaches. The limitations include problem complexity and diversity, limited computational resources, and amount of data per task. When can we expect this gap between research and real world, and I'm sure that you got this question since the 1990s, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the real world uh, to close, and what are the most promising approaches? Uh, transfer learning, lifelong learning, anything else? Okay, well that's a it's a brutal question. Makes me want to make the homework harder for the class. Ah, but anyway, yes. um, <laughs> like put me on the spot. I'll put you on the spot. So right, no, no, I, you're absolutely right, and it's it's fundamental. And and I think you know I, I often will say to people that there's not that there's not that much in terms of practically fielded systems in RL. Uh, that, that you can actually point to and say, oh, yeah, this thing is doing that using reinforcement learning. Uh, recommender systems, I think, are. I think that's a valid example, but they're they're more bandit-driven than they are typically um, like full-on kind of state prediction, value function -y kinds of things. But, you know, bandit problems are cool, too, and we're, we're good at that, so we should, we should like, take credit for that. <laughs> like, I don't I, – some people are really upset by it. I talked to Satinder Singh once, and he's like, that proves that we're a failure. The fact that the main thing that that's out there is bandit systems means we're a failure. I'm like, no, we're just good at bandits. Like bandits is important too. Let's just let's just like you know, take the win for goodness sake. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's good. The other example that I cite sometimes is uh, apparently the Nest thermostat is doing some reinforcement learning behind the scenes, particularly for the problem. It's more of a control problem really, but it's but it's particularly for the problem of um, learning. The thermodynamics of your house, right? So when if it's this temperature outside and this temperature inside, and you increase the amount of force in the furnace by this amount, what? How long is it going to take things to get warm? You know, what what's the the temp temperature change going to be and when? And so they they learn they do a kind of a model based thing where they actually learn that model and then they use that to make decisions to actually maximize uh, you know whatever minimize loss and the loss is dependent on things like how much energy you use and how how uncomfortable you are right how far off from the desired temperature uh, the system is at any given time
But yeah, so when are we going to have like general out of the box RL? Like I want to say next Thursday because it's it's good to be positive. <laughs> uh, but but I don't think that's true. I I think that it's going to be it's going to be a good long time. And there's a bunch of problems that we have to solve right before we can actually get there. It's not that we're being lazy. It's that we actually have research to do. It's it's not an easy problem. And that includes things like uh, like discovering causal relationships. But I think the the most important thing that we haven't talked about yet in this chat is abstraction. The notion that the, the low level inputs and outputs that a system is defined with respect to are not where it should be doing the, the lion's share of its decision making. It really needs to kind of pop up a level, think about things a little bit differently and make those decisions at the, at the higher level because otherwise it can't see the, the, uh, the impact of the decisions either in time or in space. That's a really hard problem and we don't really know how to do that. We don't know how people do it. We think that there's, uh, you know, some of it maybe is built in, but there's an awful lot of it that you that is that is learned. Some of that learning happens because we have we're surrounded by smart people who already know the answers to most of the problems that we have. And I think we're piggybacking on other people way more than we let our algorithms, right? If we if we put, um, you know, you put a baby in cart pole and say, you don't get fed unless you can balance the pole for 500 steps, like, I don't know that the baby can do it. But we don't think that the baby's not good at reinforcement learning. The baby is freaking amazing at reinforcement learning. It's just that the baby is getting other kinds of inputs and is expecting other kinds of environments than the random ones that we that we use for, for testing these systems. So I think it's important to, I don't know, put them in almost social situations where the reinforcement learners can learn from other things that are going on and can learn how to break up the world better from watching how other agents break up the world. It doesn't tell you how you become Newton, right? Like if we ha we don't have a reinforcement learner that, that acts that way that can then discover, oh wait, we should just think about infinity entirely differently. And we should think about infinitely divisible quantities. I don't know how you do that. That's, how, that's super hard. But it's almost certainly done on top of abstractions, right? It's only certain, almost certainly done on top of the idea that we're already viewing the world in this very cartoony kind of way. Um, and once you view it in that cartoony way, it, it affords other kinds of representational changes. And we, so we just don't, us, we don't have that mastered in RL. Help us there with the, so what are the differences or similarities uh, between what uh, neural network does, which is basically, you know, use all this input and kind of create some some abstraction there internally, and what you're saying, which is more, you know, like options or like, you know, I don't know. I, I guess you you have another paper in uh, state ab abstraction, that, and we do have a question related to that. I'll probably follow up on that, but yeah, give us some uh, intuition, like how do you compare the two? Right. So. Uh... So two things to say on that. One is the notion that if we had a kind of temporal convolution idea that works with actions, that would that would let us actually do some some really cool things in deep RL that we don't know how to do right now. So I think just like convolutions give you this sort of sense of, of connectivity in space and units in space, and maybe on a good day it can discover objects, you know, things that populate the world. Um, we need that in time too. We, if we really want to do something like options in a, in a DRL so cell. So how about the LSTM, like an LSTM cell on top of the on top of the convolutions? Do, does that fit the bill or not? Still not there. I mean, maybe, but the the I think where it becomes really hard is that it has to factor in the actions, right? So if you just let an LSTM learn on a fixed policy, it can learn some really good representations of the the temporal world. But it baked into that is the way you were acting when you were collecting that data. What you really want are temporal abstractions that allow for some modularity, right? They allow you to recombine those temporal pieces to solve new problems. And I don't think LSTMs give us that out of the box. I think we have to think about them differently to, to get to that. Uh, and so that's just one thing I would say. To, the other, to model. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I mean that's, that's exactly right. We need a model, but we need a model that can actually modularly generalize and learn from low-level data. You know, just a little thing like that. Uh, the other thing I want to point out, though, is that yes, you know, deep learning is awesome and it solves all, all kinds of problems. And it really, it really is amazing, but it's not all, it's not perfect, right? It's it's some of the things that it does is taking weird shortcuts that actually cause these systems to behave very strangely. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody has seen these examples where you know you train up something on ImageNet and it can recognize 
all these things way better than people can, but then you show it a picture of an upside down bus and it doesn't see it as an upside down bus. It sees it as, you know, a sled or like something, something insane. And so even though it's doing much better than we're like, I don't want to put the people, these people down because they're doing better than we are in RL. But, um, but it's not like, oh, we just have to do what they're doing and then we're done because I think what they're doing is also not done. And it's even more obvious in the RL setting because we make interventions, because we take actions in the world and cause weird things to happen. And so we're always going to be confronted with data that's kind of out of sample. And, and, and I can, I guess I can talk now about, so you, I guess today you were in a explainable AI call. Uh, and then so uh, it, how is explainability uh, useful to, you know, to this issues, to solving these issues in the, in the near future, if at all? Yeah, no, I think explainability and, is really and also, important. Also, it, it, is explainable AI important for the adoption of AI systems? You, you know, if I think intuitively, uh, and, and, you know, I, I work at people really are all about, you know, explainable AI, but, you know, I don't really care what are the, how the pilot of the airplane that I'm flying on, it, you know, makes the decisions. I don't care as long as it takes me from point A from to point B safely, you know, I'm good. So is explainability really that important for the adoption of AI systems, you think? I understand that there was some kind of Twitter beef about this, where uh, maybe Yuta Pearl and Jan LeCun, or no, no, and uh, Jeff Hinton were actually kind of battling this out. Like, would you want a AI doctor that is, you know, 99% accurate but can't explain itself, or one that's 80% accurate and explains itself really well? And um, so people debated that, and I think. I think it's I think it's interesting. I think the reality of the situation is that uh, that ninety percent accurate or ninety nine percent accurate is actually a really suspicious statistic unless <laughs> unless you can have a system that it can explain itself, right? Or at least somebody can explain what the heck it's doing. Because if it's only ninety nine percent accurate on X rays from this hospital, uh, you know, that's in the data set, no, I don't I don't have any reason to believe that that's going to get my case correct. It's complicated. So so I do worry about that very much. Uh, so there's two aspects. One is, yeah, for adoption, I do think that like responsibility is an important thing. And and having systems that are completely irresponsible, but they claim they're accurate, or people claim that they're accurate, but there's no responsibility behind that, like you should be suspicious. We should all be suspicious. We've been bitten by this enough times now that we should like worry that uh, just accepting, oh, 99% accurate is probably fine. Um, then later when it's not fine, it'd be like, oh yeah, well you should have known. <laughs> like, okay, well let's let's be careful about that. So that's that's one part. The other part is it may actually be really helpful. Like part of what makes people smart, maybe, is our ability to explain things to ourselves, right? So explanation is not necessarily just a, a social thing. That when you're when you're forming abstractions, when you're actually deciding how to break up the world, part of it is like you're trying to do sense making. You're trying to look at what's out there and make yourself believe that you have a reason to think that it's going to progress a certain way. And I think that's the same, I think that's the same process that's behind explanation. It's true. So it's not, it's not just to explain to others, but also to, for us researchers to better understand our own algorithms and how they work and so on. Both of those, but I was adding a third one, which is that I think our, our smart reinforcement learners, you know, years from now, will be explaining things to themselves so that they can actually Ooh. grapple with a complicated environment, right? Like, how do I know that, like, I should call that, like, a, what's, why should I make a category for spork, right? Like, I, I never saw a spork before. Yeah. Why is this important? It's like, oh, wait, no, I see why it's important because, and then it, you explain it to yourself, and it's like, okay, now spork is a thing for me. Do you know what you know what a spork is, right? It's like that, a that spoon is fork. And why do people have right. spoon forks? Because yeah. you only have to carry one utensil and it can do double duty. My, my daughter uses that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you're, so it's like a meta explainable reinforcement learning. My goodness, we're getting profound here. That's where you have <laughs> to be. It kind of ties back to your um, point about your <laughs> emphasis on model-based reinforcement learning too. Because in a sense, you're, you're saying like, you know, a policy without, without a model is, it's nice, but 
you don't really know what's going on. So I, I guess kind of explainable AI and, and model-based learning is kind of have some similarities. Yeah, I think that's a really good connection. Do you think that, so it's, you oh, sorry. Oh, no, as a follow-up, do you think it's uh, domain, um, like it's domain specific? Like how explainable something needs to be is, hmm. um, it is specific to the domain, right? Like, um, if you're diagnosing can cancer, you, you know, you might want to understand that versus um, if you're maybe trying to play a video game, maybe you don't really care as much, right? You just care about the policy. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think that's exactly right. I would still argue that you probably are doing some amount of explaining when you're solving a hard video game. Uh, True. Like, you can, you can get kind of like plateau in your in your performance unless you start to actually you know high level engage with what you're doing and how you're doing it and generating high level descriptions if not explicitly explanations at least kind of trying to break up the world differently and, and think strategically at a level uh, using a vocabulary that you didn't even necessarily have when you started playing the game right it has to kind of come out of your experience but oh no I think you're absolutely right that in some cases you know, how, you know, it's a walking robot, like exactly how it decides how to plant its foot is maybe less important than it, you know, us uh, explaining how it does that is maybe less important to us than explaining um, its rules for deciding when it's okay to walk into the bathroom with a camera, right? Like in some cases, you're right. It's like if you don't have an explicit rule, it's problematic. In other cases, you don't have an explicit rule, it's probably still fine. Like show me that you can walk consistently over a wide variety of terrains, that's maybe enough explanation for me. And the pilot example is kind of like that. Like it's not enough to just say, oh, the pilot um, has, has, you know, past the pilot's test, you want to say, oh, the pilot has flown a lot of planes in a lot of different situations and, and not crashed. And then some, uh, as a follow-up to a couple, uh, something you said a little while ago where you were saying, like, you know, our models right now don't, um, you know, some, some of the abstractions that we're, that you're talking about and are almost like, you know, like different, like, utilities, like, and then you combine them in certain ways to create, uh, um like the ability to do new things. Um, that's kind of the way I kind of, you know, kind of took what you were saying. And do you, that kind of reminds me, and I'm not an expert in this, but like more old school symbolic AI and things like that. What, like, do you, do you think that, you know, some of those classical techniques, uh, merging them with our more data-driven uh, uh, current techniques, machine learning techniques, like, like where do you see that going? Yeah, no, I, I'm a believer in that. I'm not a... Like here's this one thing, and everything is going to come from this one thing. I feel like it's 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 making things come together that's actually going to get us where we need to go. I read a book in addition to the Pearl book. I read a book by Gary Marcus and uh, and one of his colleagues at NYU, uh, Ernie Davis, on this sort of question of like where does modern AI kind of not get to where it needs to go? And their argument was very much that you need both of these pieces. It's not It's not enough to just say, oh, well, deep learning is really good at the things it's really good at, therefore it's good at everything and we should abandon the other piece of the field. Related question to this, um, is it possible, and maybe in the defense of reinforcement learning, is it possible that um, trends in, for example, industry hmm. are based on what's already been successful? So like, so, if, you, if people see a certain approach like supervised learning is very successful, people are going to want to plow in, plow onto that and, and use those methods. Is it possible that there just isn't that much reinforcement learning expertise so that people in positions where they can innovate don't take those kinds of risks? And maybe that's also something that holds it back in, in, in quote unquote real world problems? Sure, sure. To some extent, I think that's true, but it's. I don't think it's. I don't think that's the whole story, though, because I think that there are plenty of cases where very sav RL savvy people have had controls of companies and resources, and they also had trouble getting things to work really well. So it's 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 not just that. But yeah, if there was, but if everybody knew about reinforcement learning, somebody would make it do something. <laughs> right? It's it's sometimes you you don't know what the right connection is going to be. Uh, it's more serendipitous. 
And so the more people who know about it, the more serendipity we're going to have, the more success we're going to have. So, that, you know, we should all get out there and proselytize or at least help people understand the, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of thinking about the world this way. So, so maybe that's about an hour. Two yeah, minutes. Yeah. So final, right. final question. I was going to say just that. That's two okay. minutes left. Uh, final question. And uh, obviously, there's, you know, if, if we don't ask you about AGI following, you know, all this stuff, then, you know, or singularity, then it's not a, a an AI talk. So um, what is what are your predictions for the next, you know, 10, 20 years from now? And obviously, just a funny prediction. You don't have to get too serious yeah. about it. So in two, you had a tech talk on the topic, so that's what I'm asking, right? You had I a whole did, tech I talk. did. Yeah, I did. But 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 the TED talk was like, you guys need to settle down. Um, and so they basically people settled down. So I think we're good. <laughs> like in 2015, there was so much chatter about this issue, um, and you know people maybe reasonably arguing that it's not insane. It's not something that we should completely ignore. And I, I guess I'm open to that. Like some people thinking about this is fine, but I do, I did, I do think that the amount of excitement that it was generating at that time was insane. Was 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 detached from reality. Too much. Yeah, because because it's people were extrapolating from some successes, some amazing successes, but they were extrapolating the way that you'd extrapolate if you met a really smart person, and you think, okay, that smart person can do these other smart things too, but these systems are not smart people. They don't really break up the world the way that we do. They're good at the thing that they're good at. And if we wanted to be good at some other really narrow thing, we could probably do that too. But like narrow plus narrow does not equal broad. Narrow plus narrow equals too narrow. Uh, so, you know, they're like, you can't cover space with Dirac functions. So, um, yeah, no, I don't see us, like I said, I think there's a whole bunch of problems that have yet to be solved before we can really start to do that. And I've always been of the opinion of like starting small, like like thinking about what it would mean to have I don't know. I, I back in the day, the, people were saying, "Oh, we we we're there's a big push. NASA wants to give people a lot of money. I don't think they have any money anymore. But at the time, they wanted to give people a lot of money to send a robot to explore Mars, say, or maybe it was like the moons of Saturn, whatever it was." I, I read this and then I looked out my window at my backyard and I said, "I would like a robot to explore my backyard because the Roomba <laughs> that's vacuuming my house, five minutes, it's it's jammed up." Right? It finds the fringe of the carpet. It finds the chair to wedge under. It finds the little track of the sliding door, puts its wheel in it, and it's done. Right? No, of course we can't send something to the to Triton. Right? We, it's a, that's insane. We can't even get things to be autonomous here. So we need these kind of low-level autonomous behaviors, really, really understand them well. Um, whatever you know, Roomba plus plus is like things that can really go around and 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 not screw right. up and not eat the dog and mess up all the laundry. Like like <laughs> let's do that. Let's let's make that work because I think that that's how biological systems were able to bootstrap them up to you know people. So while while hype is good for getting people on board, is actually not good for doing the work to doing research and working day to day. So and it might not even be good for get out of it. <laughs> well, and it's also not good because then people get disappointed and then things don't work and then they're like, oh, well, that was a stupid idea in the first place. I've heard people say that this. Well, you know, they're already currently... working for you. They're, they're already working for you, so that's good, right? I mean, after is it, after though? they realize they're already working it... for you, they're PhD students. <laughs> What's your gamma? You know, like you <laughs> gamma close to one. Like it matters. <laughs> You can't exploit people short term and expect this to lead to good outcomes. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, I, I digress. I digress. Let's you know, let, let's be Excellent. smart and actually help the world. Professor, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate your time and and you know having your insights. It was really nice meeting thank you, you so guys. Much. You're, you're, uh, the course is in fantastic hands. I'm so so happy to to meet you and see you know kind of what's going on inside your heads. Um, and, you know, it's great to, I'm sorry I didn't get to meet the whole class, but I hope everybody's doing awesome and, uh, you know, stay safe in this uh, weird world that we're in right now. Likewise, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Likewise. Thank you. Have Thanks, a good guys. day. Bye.